Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us dealing with a loved one with memory loss. Are you looking for a way to connect with your loved one? Maybe an activity to do the next time you visit? Something other than sitting around and answering the same questions over and over again like we always seem to do? Let me tell you about some books that I discovered that changed the last visit I had with mom tremendously. They're called Two Lap Books. They are simple read aloud books for memory challenged adults. You see, people with Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementias gradually lose their ability to initiate communication with others. Because of this, these uniquely adapted books, quote, give voice to these loved ones. By using the book's large, simple text and colorful illustrations, we can initiate conversations. Most noteworthy, reading books together can make meaningful connections with our loved ones and help stimulate their mind. Caregivers will enjoy sharing these books and creating purposeful, interactive activities for engaging people with memory deficits. Best of all, reading these books together will very likely bring out memories that you can share together. If you're interested in purchasing a two-lap book, there is a link to the Amazon page in the show notes. Lydia Burdick, the author of Two Lap Books, graciously gave us an interview and conversation in episode... 15 entitled two lap books the perfect activity to do with your loved one today so thank you and definitely check out her books because as i mentioned they were a fantastic way to spend a couple of hours with my mom and two of the other residents of her care community do you care for your children and worry about your aging parents congratulations you are a member of the sandwich generation You probably have many questions about estate planning. You know, you should be making a will and you probably need some other estate planning documents, but which ones? What should you do to protect your children? How can you help your parents as they age? Where the heck do you even start? On today's episode, I interview Katherine Hodder, an estate planning attorney turned author. She enjoys working with families who would rather be doing anything else than estate planning. Her law practice featured in the Palm Beach Post made, quote, house calls to help families with their estate planning needs. She now resides in California, writing helpful articles for members of the sandwich generation. I'm sure you'll find today's episode super helpful, not too scary, but don't worry, you don't have to take notes because all the information you need are on the show notes on our website. So it's wonderful to chat with you today. Yeah, and I, I did get the book, and right. I did get a chance to go through it a little bit. So, but before we get too far into this, I forget sometimes to have people introduce themselves. Okay, which is probably a good thing to do. Yeah. Okay, so you want me to do that? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, uh, I'm Catherine Hodder. I'm an estate planning attorney turned author who wrote the book Estate Planning for the Sandwich Generation, which is from what. I have initially read is excellent. It's not difficult to understand. It's not boring as I mean, it's not the greatest topic, but (laughs) it's a necessary topic. Yeah. I think I'm one of the few people who are passionate about estate planning, but for those who aren't, um, I wanted to have a practical but accessible book for people and especially for people in the sandwich generation where they're caring for, you know, many people, young kids, aged parents, um, they don't have time to read a very long, complicated book. No, and I definitely liked the section in here that you caught. You said the conversations to have with your parents, because oh. so many parents don't want to have these conversations. Well, it's it's a difficult topic sometimes to bring with you know bring up with your parents. Uh, it would be great if you know, they wanted to talk about it, but if they didn't, I I thought it would be helpful to have sort of conversation starters or prompts um, to get the ball rolling. And then I also follow up with a kind of checklist because once you open that door and get a conversation going, you know, here's the information you should really try and capture. Yeah. And I can, I can, I can agree with all of that. My dad was very organized. They had a trust. 
he had the durable power of attorney and the health power of attorney and all that great stuff. Mm-hmm. The missing factor was he didn't discuss it with me. I don't know how much, if at all, he discussed it with my sister. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a little bit of discussion, but definitely more would have been better, especially because my mom has Alzheimer's. When he ended up in the hospital, we ended up running around like our hair was on fire trying to figure out what to do. And, and that's, you know, anytime there's a hospitalization or anything like that, it throws a family in chaos. So um, in, in the book, one of the things I suggest is putting together what I call a 911 binder. And uh, when I practiced, I would give this to my clients, whereas a section you'd put all your legal and financial and medical information in one place so that, you know, if you were, God forbid, hospitalized, Somebody can step in and understand, like, okay, where's the bank accounts? Um, you know, who has the power of attorney to make decisions and that type of thing? Because, you know, a lot of times you don't sit down and tell everybody your whole life story. So um, I thought that would be a helpful thing for families. Yeah. To just- Having gone through it somewhat recently, I can I completely agree with that. What you're probably not aware of, unless you've listened to a bunch of episodes, is... I came home from a trip and called and talked to my dad, and he seemed fine. And less than a week later, his mind went back to 1998. And it was like, holy crap, I have two parents with dementia. What the hell do I do? Oh, gosh. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, like I said, we were running around like our hair was on fire. You know, my sister had some information. I had some information. Fortunately, my husband had worked in banking for 20 years. So he had knowledge of, you know, what to do with the financial end so we could deal with our parents. You know, we were lucky in that respect. And he had the paperwork in order. It was just figuring out, you know, what what that order was was a little bit tough. Right. And actually, that's that's a huge thing to have estate planning documents before you need them. So, um, you know, a lot of people sort of think, well, you get estate planning documents, so things are handled when you die, but they're actually more important when you're living and hospitalized or incapacitated or um, start having cognitive impairment. Um, If you don't nominate other people to help you and you're in a bad situation, it it makes it more difficult for people to help you. Exactly. So I, I read the beginning of the book, but for obviously people who haven't had the opportunity yet, tell, tell my listeners your, the personal story behind the book as well, because that was, that was important in, in my opinion. Oh, okay. So um, I actually was an attorney in a finance company doing contracts, secure transactions, and um, my father uh, began a 10-year um, battle with Alzheimer's. You know, we didn't know it at the time that, you know, he was having some mini strokes and some issues. Um, and he had done all the proper estate planning and going through caring for him, uh, during the illness, uh, and subsequent death. Uh, it really struck me how important these documents are to help families navigate, um, hospitals, navigate care, navigate the money, um, And I ended up going into private practice and switching my focus into estate planning because from what I learned, even as an attorney, there are so many things I didn't know. Um, I really thought I wanted to help other people to sort of, you know, help them along with with their uh, estate planning to help their caregiving. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. I just, like I said, I went through it last year, the end of 2016, in the last year, and it's it's difficult when they can't answer questions, whether it's because their mind is not well or they're incapacitated somehow. You know, my mom obviously could not be any help, and and all of that stuff just made dealing with her more difficult because there was no plan in place, which, you know, I look back on it, and I, I don't understand why, but because he had diabetes, he had chronic illnesses, but there was no nothing in place for what would happen if he ended up in the hospital, if he died first. And so we missed that part of the planning. So that's part of the reason the podcast started is because, you know, my daughter moved out a month before my dad passed away. 
and I have the time to do deep dives on the internet, and it's still very difficult to find information. So I like to listen to podcasts when I'm cooking and doing other things, and I looked for one on, you know, Alzheimer's support, and there really wasn't any good one. So I'm like, okay, fine, I'll start it myself. <laughs> well, it's terrific because, uh, you know, my father, he passed in 2010. I could tell you I'm learning now all these great resources that I wish existed <laughs> when we yeah. were going. There's actually, and I'm trying to figure out how to make an episode about it, there's actually through the Alzheimer's Association it's called Alzheimer's Direct, I believe, and it's a program that you're, when you're diagnosed, your doctor should basically hand you off to them because they, they have all these resources, and there's a big disconnect between, you know, I don't know if, I'm assuming doctors don't know about it. Um, we've got, my husband's running for city council, and after all of that's over, so starting 2019, I'm hoping to get on the advocacy team and the the volunteer team to help more doctors realize that, you know, if you give somebody this kind of diagnosis, it's got to be followed up with all of this kind of support because there's still a lot of stigma. A lot of people think, well, you know, it's my spouse, it's my job to take care of them. And 99% of the time that's not physically or emotionally possible to do it all, nor should you try. And it's, you know, it's, it's part of the, resources and learning that I'm trying to share. Cause like you said, you're learning about stuff now and so you're sharing the wealth and that's what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. No, that's a great idea. You know, having, having the resources right when they get the diagnosis, because there is so much fear, you know, uh, like you said, stigma. Um, I think some people take it as a death sentence, which mm -hmm. it not necessarily is. Um, and, uh, I think certainly knowing about services that are available Maybe they don't need it at that point, but to know down the road what could help them. So, for example, um, we contacted hospice um, three years before he died just because I contacted to say, I just want to know when we should call you. And they they came and visited with us and, and saw him and looked at he already had the diagnosis. And they said, we can, you know, based on where he is, we can help you right now, which was a shock to all of us and a godsend, really. Yeah, hospice is great. Um, my mom is not close to needing that at this point. She's 75. She is in later stages. But physically, I mean, walks fine. You know, just everything about her physically is great. It's just her mind is bad. Yeah. But I've heard through her care community that there are hospice companies that specialize in um, people with, you know, cognitive impairment, which would have probably helped my dad because we yeah. had caregivers to take care of them in the home while he was on hospice. And my mom got fine with it, you know, after a short period of time, but my dad never did. He just fought constantly. He thought he was overcoming, you know, like getting over the flu or a cold and he did mm -hmm. not understand what was going on. And it just made the whole process so much harder, which was unfortunate because I hear all these stories, Oh, you know, hospice and, it's all rainbows and unicorns and, you know, we were there when they took his last breath and it was so wonderful. And I'm like, oh, they called me and said he passed and it was the best night's sleep I'd had in three months because, you know, it was a constant battle. And it was sad because if he'd planned a little better for that part, mm -hmm. he didn't want to go back on dialysis, which was fine. His heart wasn't strong enough for it. So if we had just... As a family planned for his end, everybody would have been better, especially him. So I am very a very big advocate on planning, and I, I love the book. I'm going to definitely share it with my husband. He's been, he's been running around like crazy the last few days, so he he's only aware that this book came. <laughs> okay, good. and then I'm definitely sharing it with my support group because there's a lot of people that are needing these conversation starters. They've got family members that don't want to talk about it, don't think they need to talk about it. You know, a lot of the things that you've discussed in your books, none of your business, mm -hmm. you know, I can handle my money myself, even though they're not handling it well, because, you know, they're unaware that their mind is not working the way it's supposed to. So it's definitely a great tool. So I was glad that you reached out to me. Yes. And, and it's a, uh, 
it's a delicate area because your parents are your parents. So Mm -hmm. it's hard for them to accept help or they want to be the ones, you know, uh, helping you making the decisions. And so one of the tips I put in there is, you know, start conversations by, um, getting their advice because parents like to give advice. So say, this is what I'm thinking about, you know, what do you think about that? So, yeah, I read some of those and that sounded, that sounded great. And I've got listeners. I think that'll really help, um, people that family is in earlier stages. So they're kind of trying to navigate the, the needs versus keeping the respect and the dignity of the adult parent. And that's always a nice tightrope. And you, you probably walked that one. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, and and it switches day by day. You know, it's it's just a de- it's it's a delicate dance, I would guess. Yeah, that's an excellent term. So the book starts with what we, as the part of the sand- sandwich generation, which is more my sister than me, which I think I'm grateful for. Um, it's where we should start. So we need to start with ourselves first, according to the book. Is that correct? Yeah, so that's what I recommend. So sort of get your own house in order um, before you get into your parents' business. So, you know, put your own estate plans in place, figure out, you know, make the decisions of, you know, who would make medical decisions for me? Who would handle my finances? Because that way you can really uh, understand the issues involved. And when you talk to your parents, you're, you, have, you can have an informed conversation. That makes sense. So what other suggestions, I mean, that we got what, the first hundred pages is all on what to do. Yeah. So the, the first, the first step is getting your own house in order. And I, I, uh, walk you through 10 relatively easy steps to put an estate plan together. So it would be things like, you know, checking your beneficiary designations because, uh, those operate outside of a will. And if you get, and, you know, operate outside of probate. So if you, um, make sure, you know, certain bank accounts are going to the people you want them to, that will cut down on problems. Uh, you know, it talks about evaluating uh, life insurance, if that's right for you. It talks about the documents you need, such as a health care power of attorney, um, a financial power of attorney, also called a durable power of attorney, um, a living will, which is also called advanced medical directives. Mm-hmm. And um, then finally, a will and uh, a trust. And then it also talks about, you know, if you have a business, you know, what kind of succession planning would you want? And then walks you through other things you can do. Um, And then the second part is, okay, you got yourself together. Um, Now it's time to talk to your parents. And I list um, five sort of talks to have with them, um, which covers, you know, their financial situation, uh, their health care situation. Plans for as they age, you know, what do they want? What happens when they can't live on their own? Um, Talks about end of life care. And that sort of talks about um, advanced medical directives, meaning what measures do you want taken or not taken when you have a terminal or end stage illness? And then the last is really um, about the family legacy. Um, You know, this doesn't all have to be gloom and doom and depressing, you know, you want to capture, you know, happy stories, um, important life events that they've lived through. Um, you want to make sure you don't lose the family recipes and, um, make sure you can bring out photos and write down who's in them and the story behind it. So, um, it's all sort of getting a picture together with your parents so that when something happens to them, you are armed with the information to help them. That's interesting you make the comment about the photos. We have tons of photos. Um, I'm a professional photographer. That's the other half of my life. And we have tons of photos that we have no idea who's in them because my mom has Alzheimer's. My mom's mom had Alzheimer's. And my great-grandmother also had cognitive memory issues at the end of her life. So there's a lot of family history that's being lost And Mm -hmm. I keep saying, well, I need to, you know, talk to my uncle. I do still have a grandmother. She's 100. Oh, her her mind is amazing. But she's mostly blind from glaucoma. So I'm not really sure. You know, some of the pictures are kind of small. And I'm thinking of scanning them and projecting them on the wall. And maybe she can help figure out who they are. But these are all, you know, they're very time consuming projects. And I haven't gotten around to it. And I really should. So (laughs) it's 
you know, it's it's hard because there's pictures and I know it's family, so I have them. But if I don't get them identified, they're just going to end up gone because I have one child and she won't know who they are. And my yeah. niece and nephew are much younger than my daughter. And they, they'll be even more clueless than her. So, you know, it's not earth shattering that it has to be done, but it is something that I'm sure I would regret if I don't get it done. So, yes. And that's, that's a way that you can, you know, start conversations. So say, Hey, I'm going through the photos and tell me about your parents, your grandparents. And you know, what did they die of? And are you concerned about that in the family? I mean, one thing to, you know, talk about is family medical history, because you certainly don't want to lose information about that um, because it can help future generations. Because I um, had my mom at the doctor at the very beginning of the year just for um, minor little, you know, health checkup. And I kept emphasizing when I made the appointment, when we showed up there, when the nurse came in the room, every single time, I'm like, I need to see mom's diagnosis. My sister and I are operating a little bit in the dark, Mm -hmm. not 100%, but, you know, I like as much information as I can get so that I can make a decision and move forward. And, you know, not that there's a lot of decisions you can make. Yes, okay, she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Great. You know, that doesn't help decision making, but at least it was, it makes me feel better. But one of the biggest things on her diagnosis was it said, oh, yes, there's no family history of memory loss. And I'm like, huh, that's baloney. You know, I'm like, I didn't understand how my dad could let that slide by. You know, I don't know. If the doctor talked to my mom alone, which at the time she was diagnosed would have been dumb anyway. So I never did figure that one out. So, but it was just interesting that, you know, it, no history. And it's like, yes, we have a lot of history. So, well, you know, it's not uncommon for spouses to cover for one another or not see it as significant as an objective person would be. It's it's interesting. My maternal grandmother had a brain aneurysm that leaked for probably three months. Mm -hmm. And they said, when they finally figured out what was the problem, they told my grandfather that she had a 5% chance of living through the surgery and pretty much a 0% chance of surviving without the surgery. They never discussed what would happen if she lived. Well, wherever the blood touches the brain, the brain is damaged permanently. So after the surgery, she was, you know, at a certain stage with memory and, you know, it wasn't horrible, but, you know, she had issues, but they were workable, but she went downhill after that. And I specifically asked my mom's doctor, would that be normal? And he said, no, she obviously had something else. So I think she had undiagnosed Alzheimer's because I've talked to my aunts and uncles and they're like, oh, no, no, she, it was just the aneurysm. I'm like, oh, really? You know, I asked one doctor one question, and I know that that's not accurate. So it, the family medical history part is very interesting. And it's, I think it's crucial because, you know, I can go to my doctor and say, I have this very bad family history over here and diabetes on the other side. So, you know, yeah. I have to, I, ha- I know that's my history, and I take great pains to avoid the diabetes and avoid all the stuff that they tell you to take, you know, it's always eat right and exercise. (laughs) It's no magic pill. Those are the two things that always crop up for every prevention. So I do that. And, you know, it's, it's just frustrating when I see just the history is so wrong. And, you know, like I said, my dad had his estate all pretty well planned, but it still had hiccups Um, he had his, uh, what was it? The succession, not, uh, trustees. So when he passed away, it went to my mom. It was not clear in their trust. What happened if my mom was, um, incapacitated, unable to act Um, on the trust. We actually had to go to an attorney and have him read through it mm -hmm. and find, you know, thankfully he found it. We didn't have to go to court. But it was just interesting that it wasn't really clear. It wasn't clearly laid out. Like his was on page one and hers was like on page 11. Oh, gee. Yeah, it was really odd. And, you know, like I said, we didn't discuss, okay, well, what happens if something happens to dad? I mean, even if without chronic illness, I mean, he could have been in a car accident. Anything could have happened. So 
I'm, I'm a huge advocate for planning. Yes. So yeah. what other, what other things should we consider before we rush off into our afternoon here? Well, I think, you know, um, some tips about talking with your, your parents, um, would be helpful to, for your, 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 uh, listeners. And, uh, so for example, um, having patience with them, because it's not something you're going to be able to have, you're not going to accomplish this in one conversation. It's going to be a series of, um, smaller conversations. Um, if you have siblings, it's a good idea to be transparent with them of, look, I'm talking to mom and dad about this. This is what they're saying. Um, because it, it brings everybody together and nobody can accuse one sibling of overreaching or, you know, uh, trying to influence them. Um, as you talk to your parents, keep notes about, um, what they're saying so you can, um, get back to it in other conversations. Um, don't try to pressure them because again, they are your parents, um, and they will have resistance if they feel like they're under pressure. Um, the important thing is to focus the conversation on getting the information you need about their medical, about their financial. It's not to write old transgressions or, um, you know, that is a good point. Address the other, address any other family dynamics. You really want to focus uh, on the information you need, um, and really kind of empathize with them. I mean, they're getting in a stage of their lives where they are losing control, you know, physically, they may be having realized they're having some mental or cognitive issues. And so it's a difficult, uh, time when they're the parent, but they need more care. Um, and sometimes you just have to listen without judgment. They might have, um, you know, in these conversations, they might, uh, be very angry about the way their life turned out or how things were done or not done. Um, especially if planning wasn't involved, you know, it's kind of a stressful time to make up for lost time. You know, so for example, one spouse dies and they might've had, you know, handled all the finances. Suddenly the other spouse is left being like, well, I don't know where our money is or how bills were paid or anything like that. It's, it's extremely stressful. Um, and finally, you know, as you talk to them, uh, to your parents, consult an attorney. So, you know, if they get to places, you know, talk to, uh, an estate planning attorney, cause they can really help in, um, developing a, a plan to help your parents. And do you suggest, um, in our support group last week, a couple of the, um, people there, ladies were, had had a lot of success getting help with an elder law attorney, which I don't think I'd ever heard of. Yeah. So elder law is a little bit more specialized. Um, and you know, that focuses on, um, uh, it, advanced aging and, uh, Medicare planning or Medicaid, I'm sorry, Medicaid planning, which is a specialized area. So, um, they're extremely helpful in navigating, um, people with end of life issues. So that's very helpful to know because they were very, we go around the room, introduce ourselves, and say who we're caring for, even if we're not responsible for them 24-7. Like, my mom is in a memory care community. Some people have their family members at home. This one particular lady, after hearing a whole bunch of people, said you know, she took her couple, three minutes to talk about her experience with an elder law attorney and the benefits that she had from it. And she was kind of speaking to one person in particular but it was like, oh, okay, that's not a thing I've heard of. So I made a, I made a mental note because I knew we were going to talk to ask mm -hmm. exactly what those kind of attorneys specialized in. So that's very helpful. So we need, yes. might need both of you guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know why dying and getting to the end of life has to get so complicated. <laughs> I've said after, you know, after my dad passed away, I said, it shouldn't require this much paperwork to die. It's they just crazy. Do. Well, and so by doing things during your life, you can cut down on the paperwork. So um, you mentioned you have a will and a trust. I mean, having a trust can really cut down on the whole probate process. Everybody does go through probate, but whether you go quickly or, or slowly is really up to the documents you put together during your life. Well, he must have done pretty good on that part because that, that part did not take terribly long. That's great. I don't... 
that, all that time is a little bit of a blur, which I'm sure is normal. So, but I, the biggest challenge was, was kind of like, there was no planning for my mom. My dad assumed she'd come live with me, which was mm-hmm. a very bold assumption. I hadn't had a place for her to live. My daughter had just moved out a month before he died. So when he was thinking this, I didn't even have a place for her. And my studio is attached to my house. So I, you know, I work from home and that would not work. And, you know, it's just, he never even talked to me about it. So it's like, that was, that was where the planning fell completely apart. Mm -hmm. I learned that tidbit from his friend and it was a little bit like a slap in the face because it was like the message I got was my life didn't mean much. I could just drop everything and take care of my mom, which I'm sure is not probably the message he wanted to leave me with, but that's what happened. Yeah. I mean, I think though it's hard for parents to think that way, you know, like imagine the scenario. So he probably didn't think about it that hard. Probably not. You know, and they, everybody always says, well, I just want to stay in my home. Well, that's fantastic until you figure out that your home is not a safe place to be. Mm-hmm. And I've done, and I actually did a three part series on what to do with the family home, minor changes, major changes, you know, all in the name of keeping your loved ones safe. Cause my dad had some falls while he was on hospice and the hospice nurse got really upset because he kind of assumed the caregivers were not doing what they were supposed to do because he was falling. And I was like, well, the problem is, is he won't let them do what they need to do. And he's being very stubborn. And there's a a step from the room that he liked to stay in up to the hallway, to the bathroom. It was just one step, but that one step was, it was a nuisance. And after investigating options for my mom, I knew that the memory community would be good because there's other people like her there. She's social. She sits around and one of these days I'm going to be able to sneak in and catch the ladies having their conversations <laughs> and find out what they're talking about because the staff tells me, oh, yeah, they're over there. They've been talking for a couple hours. And I think, about what? You know? <laughs> like, how often is the conversation repeat? So I'm, they're renovating, so it's a little harder to sneak in because they don't have – everything's, you know, in chaos, which is – Definitely a challenge, period. But when you've got people with cognitive issues, I feel a little I feel a little sorry for the staff that they're fixing the place up. <laughs> but I'm going to sneak in on them. I'm going to catch them, and I'm going to listen to their conversation because I'm just I'm curious all to get out. Like, what do you talk about? But my mom's been there April, May, June, July, August, so about 17 months, and she hasn't declined mentally that I can see if it if she has it's very minor Mm -hmm. and I think I think the you know she she kind of helps the other people around her because she's physically more fit than the rest a lot of them so she Mm -hmm. helps them and so it's it's very family-like and it's been really good for her and it I'm sad that my dad never he never had the opportunity to to investigate that mm-hmm. and see that it's not some nightmare scenario where they're just like shoved in a corner and forgotten. It's not a warehouse for people whose minds have left the building. It's you know if you find a nice place, it it's I think it's been very good for her. Being here with me would not have been good for her. Yeah, I mean, you know, certainly um, nursing care and assisted living and all the senior living options have expanded as people's life expectancies increase. Um, you know, I, from the research I've done, um, I think they're amazing. I mean, some of them, I'm like, I'd sign me up now. So. We've tried to talk my grandmother into considering um, the assisted living side of where mom is. So it's a two-story assisted living building and then the memory care community is a single story it's it's basically a circle with a beautiful courtyard in the middle so they have access they can go in and out I mean it's it's beautiful because she doesn't see well and her home is older and it needs quite a lot of help she I think well first off she really shouldn't live on her own 
But secondly, I know that once she was there, she could just go for a month, make no commitment, just mm -hmm. go for a month and try it out. I'm sure she'd love it. She'd have people waiting on her hand and foot. And you know what? When you get to be 100, you should have people waiting on you. Right. And actually, it's it's funny. Um, in, in the book, I do uh, tell an antidote about uh, a friend of mine, her, I guess, grandmother was in her late eighties living on her own. And, um, she had some issues. So she had to live with her daughter for a while, but then she needed more care. She was dead set against going into, you know, uh, in a senior community and, um, really fought it tooth and nail. But finally it was, there was just no way they could care for her. And three months later, she was the queen of the place. She loved it. She'd invite people to parties there. <laughs> um, you know, so it was a, Complete turnaround. So I think it's what you don't know. Yeah. And I think, well, I don't even know that they had those kind of communities that far in the past. You know, I think these are much more recent. Oh, I agree. But they're, you know, the, the one thing that I think they should plan on more is to have little cottages. Instead of, like, my grandmother lives on her own in a home that's on a lake. She can't see the lake very well, but I'm sure she's been there since 1974. So I'm sure she gets the sense of it when the sun goes down. You know, just that mood. I wouldn't want to lose that either. And yeah. I definitely wouldn't want to move from my own single family home into an apartment inside a building with a bunch of other old people. Yeah. I can see why she's resistant. But mm -hmm. that's just one part. So if they had little cottages where, you know, like one and two bedroom cottages, I think the transition from your own home into assisted living would be a lot smoother. It'd probably cost a lot more to have these cottages, but you know, that's, that's my suggestion for that part of the industry. But you know, I, I see them helping each other. There's, there's always activities, brunches, barbecues. There's always something going on. You know, Bible study like twice a week and, the hair lady is there, and I mean, it's just, it's really nice. And then you're not, you know, you're not, I don't want to use the word burden, but you're not, you don't have to have your kids help you work. Because I know my aunt does a lot of stuff, and she finally had to put her foot down and said, I'm going to do A, B, and C, and that's it. Mm -hmm. So she has a friend that drives her around a lot. You don't have to, you don't have to do that. You know, you can, you can call up the van and say, I need to do this and that and the other thing and schedule it and, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely something people need to look into with an open mind because yes. living at home until you die is really not always possible. And it's really not always the greatest, you know, it wasn't the best scenario for my dad. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, I'm an advocate of definitely, you know, planning, getting as much information as you can and making the decisions that you think are going to be the best. Cause obviously we never know for sure until we do it. Mm -hmm. And those, you know, selling your home and moving to assisted living is kind of hard to undo. Yeah, true. Um, we we rented out my mom's house, so we could put we could put her back if we had to, but wouldn't it wouldn't be uh, beneficial for her. Somebody has to be with her. Mm -hmm. So, but I really appreciate the talk, and I, like I said, I'm sharing this book with all the listeners. Is it on Amazon? So I can link it from the yes, uh, it's on Amazon. Awesome. So I will definitely link that account through the show notes so people can just click through and order it because it really is great. Like I said, I sat down and spent some time with it and I was very impressed. So well, thank you. I appreciate it. And you have a fantastic afternoon. Thank you. You too. Thanks. Bye-bye. There's so much useful information out there and, and so much information we need to take care of our parents and our families and I know sometimes it's really hard to gather it all together in a short period of time in a manner that you can access easily. And that's the whole point of this podcast is to share what I've learned and what I've gathered through caring for my parents, my mom, and researching information for all these podcast episodes. So I hope you're finding them useful and hopefully a little entertaining as well. If you are, would you do me a huge favor? Go to iTunes, Apple Podcasts, and leave a rating and maybe even a quick little review. 
That's how new people find our podcast. And as I've said before, I can't be a supportive podcast if people don't know about me. So thank you again. And I will talk to you again next week. MBK Senior Communities is dedicated to being the preferred senior living provider in the markets they serve. They create warm, inviting living spaces in desirable locations. They offer a variety of services and programs to enrich the lives of residents and their families. And by getting to know their residents, their personal preferences, and their individual needs, MBK Senior Communities can better contribute to their well-being and provide care that's right for them. They are committed to enhancing independence and quality of life, serving others the way they prefer to be treated, and providing care that is delivered with integrity, dignity, and compassion. Currently serving the Western United States, but expanding. Why not contact your local community for a tour and see for yourself why most of their residents say they felt at home from their very first visit? You can get more information by visiting their website at mbk seniorliving.com or call 949-242-1400.